I met Mary Mahoney when she wrote a study guide for the digital newspaper project. We had just added two 1909 to 1922 newspapers from Bridgeport and Norwich to chroniclingamerica.loc.gov and to help patrons discover how to use our newspapers for their research. The study guide can be found on the CDNP website, ctdigitalnewspaperproject.org, along with a list of the have scanned or plan to scan. Mary's study guide is called Library War Service 1917 to 1919. During World War I, librarians were collecting and distributing books to soldiers and overseas. The guide includes tips on how to search and find newspaper articles on the topic. Mary Mahoney is a PhD candidate in history at Connecticut, where she studies the history of bibliotherapy or the use of books as medicine. She came to this topic after she was offered two cancer memoirs and a history of the JFK assassination during the and wondered what therapeutic effect such reading might have. Her work focuses on the relationship between reading and health and examines the stakes of investing reading with the authority. Her work has been published and made the subject of exhibit on bibliotherapy and World War I, an online version of which can be found at booksasmedicine.com. She is also the host of a podcast called Chapters, which shares the readers' lives through the books that have meant the most to them. Mary will now talk to us about prescribing from the bookshelf, Louise Sweet, and Connecticut's role in the library war service. Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone here at the State Library. It's a real privilege to be here with you and to share my research. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about an idea that every reader has long known to be true, but that librarians and physicians joined together of, during World War I, and that's the idea that books can serve as medicine. Before I begin, I just want to take a minute and ask everyone here to imagine a book they return to as a kind of medicine in their life. What is it about this book that makes it so comforting? Is it funny? Does it offer you a chance to reflect on something in your life? Does it give you a language to describe your own experience? Does it offer escape? Do you return to this book the same therapeutic effect each time or something different? Now I want you to imagine prescribing a book for someone else. How would you try to apply your own unique relationship with a treasured book to another reader? What book would you prescribe? Would you take into account the aspect of the reader's life that might need help or comfort, or maybe just base it on their personality? Would the reading taste before they experienced ill health or a challenging be worth considering or not? That's exactly what librarians serving in the Library War Service attempted to do when they began to apply books therapeutically during the war. Caring for thousands of soldiers, librarians transferred library shelves into medicine cabinets, prescribing books to meet the needs of each patient, and struggling to offer literary cures to the war and its diseases. This work led to the formation of a new therapy called bibliotherapy, which librarians and physicians hope to make a science after the war. Today I want to tell you that story. It's a story that's both familiar, I hope we could all think of some book that has had a therapeutic effect in our lives, but it's also For example, I don't think anyone has ever seen a bibliotherapist prescribe books at a bedside, as we can see here at Bridgeport Hospital in the years just after the war. The war presented a librarians like Louise Sweet, who served in a military hospital in New Haven, to reimagine their library shelves as medicine cabinets, and today I'm going to tell you that story. So before I jump into that, I just want to give us a brief overview of Connecticut's role. During the war, about 63,000 state residents served in either the U.S. or Allied forces, and here we can see some of them leaving for training. Uh, Connecticut's manufacturers 
also played a role in war preparation. We might think about, for example, Manchester silk, the role of Waterbury's brass industry, or even Bridgeport's Remington Arms manufacturers, which produced 50% of the U.S. All arms cartridges, for example. But arms weren't the only resources Connecticut or the U.S. broadly provided for its soldiers during the war. From the start, the government was intent on establishing a program to provide and I want to think with you today about why the government or relief organizations like the Red Cross believed books were so valuable to war service. Specifically, I want to talk today about the Library War Service, a service created by the Library Association and the Library of Congress to provide reading materials to the troops during the war. Over the course of the war, working with other organizations like the Red Cross, the YMCA, the Knights of Columbus, the Library War Service between seven and 10 million books to soldiers serving both at home and abroad. This was a service that initially provided books for training and recreation, uh, but eventually librarians working in the service believed that books were therapeutically, and they set out to create a system that would allow them to match the right book to the right patient. So here we can see um, some posters from the Library War Service, which I can return to. But first, I just want to say that this is not the first war in which relief organizations or the government believed that providing books to troops was a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, so if you think about the Civil War, here we see Army Square Hospital, which is located in Washington, D.C. It is where the National Air and Space Museum is located now. Um, and at that hospital, for example, people like Walt Whitman, who served there as read newspapers to soldiers recuperating from illness or injury. Uh, he provided um, books uh, to soldiers, and also relief organizations provided religious and moral tracts to soldiers there. Um, as a Connecticut, Connecticut regiment in the Civil War actually traveled with a library attached to a wagon to all of their campaigns. So that's how important they thought books were. What made the Library War Service during World War I unique was the scale of its system and the ambitions of its to meet the needs of readers on an individual basis. The Library War Service began as a collaboration between the American Library Association and the Library of Congress to create an efficient means of collecting books. So they began with a $320,000 grant from the Carnegie Corporation and fundraising that eventually totaled over $5 million. With this money, they initially built 36 camp libraries, delivering books to over 500 locations, including military hospitals. Originally, this service just distributed books to, domestically to training camps, and we can see them here on this map, but eventually their service extends to France, Germany, um, Russia, Siberia, and even to prisoners of war through Switzerland. The books in their service came from donations from the public and were purchased with money uh, money from fundraising. In Connecticut, as in every other state, public libraries took up collections, and some towns even went door to door demanding donations. So and for example, that's what happened in Waterbury. They sent young people in a car around the town door to collect books, and they collected over 25,000 books um, and had the highest total in the state, followed by Bridgeport at around 15,000, New Haven, and then Hartford at about 5,000. Uh, the reliance proved to be a huge problem. Americans were willing to donate books, organizers found, but not often desirable books. So as an example, one uh, reported that she wanted to donate her diary, thinking that that's what the troops would want to read. And someone else donated a book on undertaking, believing that that's what someone would want to read at the front. So these are the kinds of so to guide donations, newspapers like the Hartford Current printed um, advertisements directing what kind of books should be donated. And they asked for educational textbooks, magazines, and claimed that novels, travel books, and biographies were genres. They did make clear, um, they said they do not want out of books of any kind. They do not want the kinds of books that appeal especially to women. And I want us to keep that in the back of our heads. Why they want books that women like to read. What does that even mean? And 
what is that setting up for the war? It's, it's pointing us to a problem that they're going to face, which is librarians really prize themselves as being experts on books, as knowing what kind of to read what kinds of books. So children's librarians know what children like to read and so on. But the problem of the war is that no one can really predict what men who have seen active service will be comforted by in terms of their reading lives. So this is a I want us to keep that in the back of our minds um, for something that happens later. Once donated or purchased, books were brought here to the state library where they were shipped to distribution centers. Books literally traveled with troops on transport ships overseas accounts of these kind of romantic images that books went with troops overseas and then as they were marching towards the front a book would be passed from soldier to soldier and almost ripped apart and then cast aside on the side of the road um, over uh, each camp library here in the u.s was provided space for up to 10,000 books and 200 readers we can see a model camp library here soldiers could select books from a standardized collection shipped to each camp popular selections in fiction, but also these educational textbooks, and also war manuals. None of them had ever served in the military before, had no knowledge of weaponry, and the camp librarians believed it was in part their role to educate them. These libraries were incredibly popular from the start because they offered, in the words of one soldier, a book or two and a chance to read and dream. So the camp library becomes a kind of um, um, in training camps. Librarians and all camp librarians were men. That was in fact the only requirement. You didn't even have to be a librarian, you just had to be a man. Um, believed their work in camp libraries was part of the war effort. Some of us may be familiar with the iconography that we see here on the left, which is from World War II, which makes use of the metaphor that books are weapons in the war of ideas. Uh, but this was something that librarians in World War I also to be true. Uh, if, the war, if World War I was a war to make the world safe for democracy, then librarians intrinsically believed that they were helping the war effort by providing soldiers with materials that would explain what democracy was in the first um, Their work, in the words of one camp librarian who published many ill-advised but deeply felt poems, wrote um, that the book could translate the message of the war into the speech of the gun. So why were books thought so important to those who organized and ran the war service? Despite their educational and recreational purposes, the camp libraries built by the war service originally stemmed from a progressive idea that it as a particular kind of, me of medicine, specifically as prophylactics, as a way to safeguard men from harm. So some relief workers leading up to World War I traveled to the Mexican border where they had um, offered relief services to American servicemen patrolling the border and the behaviors that they witnessed there outraged them. They saw drinking, they saw gambling, they saw ransom. and if you're a progressive those are things you absolutely hate and you're trying to eliminate in society. So with this experience in mind they really truly believed that reading could play an active role in what they called social and we now think about social hygiene as a movement that was meant to curb vice and prostitution and distribute um, sexual education materials largely through printed materials. Uh, so they literally wanted to reform men to be better people than they were before the war. So really it was a moral imperative at the start of the war. And from the beginning, from the moment camp libraries open, Americans report success on these efforts. Uh, as the War Library Bulletin claimed, the libraries so far established are proving of incalculable value as an antidote, antidote for drinking, gambling, and dissipation of all kinds. One librarian reported offering a wish in the statistic. Practically 75% of men preferring a book to a pack of cards, a bottle of rum, or a set of dice. Um, it's, that statistic is based in absolutely nothing except a wish. There's really no research to back that up. However, it's important to note that these early successes were when the camp libraries were mainly um, administering to servicemen who had never actually seen active battle. None of them had they were preparing to serve. Um, so social hygiene may have driven the library war service at the start, 
but the wart absolutely transformed the use of books as medicine. Specifically, librarians were imagining ways to apply books therapeutically to the by the war itself, um, to treat soldiers in general, tubercular, orthopedic, and neuropsychiatric, or what we would call mental hospitals. In 1918, service established a hospital library service reflecting the needs for a dedicated hospital service to the sick and wounded. No longer was their concern mainly a question of morality or hygiene, rather they now turned their attention to the therapeutic as a part of recovery. What had been an attempt to reform servicemen became a, a means of reconstructing them instead. In the hospital library war service, librarians were every major hospital. This was not a development that was met with universal acceptance. As one librarian noted, all the army hospitals wanted books, but not all wanted librarians. To gain their expertise, the ALA developed a specific uniform for hospital librarians. We can see it here in this image. And this was designed to give them a kind of authority because they're working in a hospital where doctors are wearing white coats, nurses wearing arms, so they want to fit in and literally have a marking of, of their expertise in some way. I should also note that the librarians in the hospital library were service were only women. Only women were allowed to serve in hospitals because there was this gender notion that taking care of the sick than men. Um, so it's only women in this service. And here we can see one of them at work, and you can see the ways that her uniform is sort of helping her fit in with the other members. Of Every day, hospital librarians would tour the wards of the hospital, just like doctors making rounds. And they would get to know their patients and interview them about their reading likes and dislikes. Sometimes they would consult with doctors about were appropriate for specific patients, and that was especially true in cases of shell shock and psychiatric complaints. And they did this based on the idea that books could heal. Different books could affect the mind and body differently. Some, some stimulants, all determined by the needs of the patients. And hospital librarians learned on the job what kinds of books healed and what harmed. And we know this from research they published during and after the war. So for example, we know that fiction was by far genre. As one librarian wrote, stories are sometimes better than doctors. Detective fiction was particularly popular as something that offered an engrossing escape to readers. As another hospital librarian explained, Holmes is a physician. Zane Grey Westerns were some of the most popular books during the war. As another librarian noted, the epidemic of authors is more common than that of disease. Periods of Zane Greyism will be followed by things for Tarzan Ray. And the Library War Service was constantly trying to raise money, and so they were constantly writing letters to a hospital saying, do you have any good anecdotes we can use in a fundraising campaign? And so the most popular one that they story of a man who got a spinal injury from a motorcycle accident, and he's rushed into the hospital, and he only says two words. And the first word is smoke, so someone puts a cigarette in his mouth. And the second word is book, so someone hands him a Zane and he later claimed that getting the Zane Grey book was the start of his recovery. So they were delighted to hear this story, and it appears in every donation mailer that they created. Librarians wrote reflections on their work during the war, where we can see them trying to work why certain genres appeal more than others to certain patients. And for some of them, this is common sense work. So if you have someone who has a long convalescence ahead of them, it makes sense to prescribe a long novel, because they'll be engrossed for a long period of time, them escape their situation. But sometimes common sense prescriptions backfired. So in one case, a librarian prescribed a humor book to a depressed patient. And she later writes and says, this was a huge mistake, please no again, because the patient saw this as it totally ruined the trust I had with my patient. I asked you before when we were talking about donated books, and I, they were very intent that no one ever donate anything that women might like that this was going to be a problem. So probably the biggest thing that blew their minds was that in hospitals, the genre were romance novels, particularly for men who had homesickness, which they believed was a real medical condition. So they really tried to make sense of why men suddenly loved 
in romance novels. Why is this happening? And why as librarians, as experts, could they not predict it or explain it? So they had to come up with a rationale for why this was happening. So this is what they decided. And before I say this, I want to say this is what 1918 said, not me in 2018. So they claimed that when men get sick, they turn into women. No comment. <laughs> and this explains in part why men would then love reading romance novels because they've become feminine through illness and injury. And this is actually an ingenious explanation because it has built into it an automatic sign of recovery. Because as they wrote, as soon as a man starts requesting Westerns again or a military biography, we know he's getting better, he's a man again. But when he wants a love story, we know it's bad but we have to keep having, we have to keep dispensing them. So th these are the kind of mental gymnastics that they're doing to explain serve as medicine. And what this really tells them, if nothing else, is that books are a powerful, if unstable, drug. So patients could choose their own books, and this influenced how librarians chose books for their libraries. They instituted censorship that we might think of as a first do no harm approach. No book that could harm a patient would make its way into the library. Here librarians imagine themselves as the only thing standing between a patient and a book that might be either or poison. Uh, librarians imagine themselves as experts that could shape the literary diet of their patients. They drew on their own standards of morality and ideas about how books might affect the mind and body to determine the kinds of books they need to consume. Librarian Louise Sweet, who was stationed at United States Army General Hospital Number 16 in New Haven, Connecticut, wrote about the rules she devised to guide her own literature. And she's fairly indicative of the field, so she's actually a really good example to think about. It's important to note that the hospital where she worked only treated patients who were living with tuberculosis. So an important idea that guided was the idea that illness and injury make people particularly suggestible that it's very easy to influence someone who's sick or injured. So no books that could play on how suggestible readers become through illness or injury were allowed into the And for her, this meant no, no novels that showed doctors and especially librarians as villains. Those were all out. Nothing that would fuel the delusions of a mental patient, generally speaking, and no propaganda. Um, is anyone here familiar with the Sacco and Benzetti trial from the 19 teens, 1920s. So for those who aren't, it was basically a, an armed robbery case that resulted in a murder and two Italian immigrants of the crime and eventually executed. And their radical politics, the fact that they self-identified as anarchists became a meaningful part of the case. So Louise Sweet had a patient who asked for materials about this case. He said, I've heard about this. I wanna know more about it on Sacco and Vanzetti, and she said, absolutely not, because if you read this, you'll turn into an anarchist, and none of us can have that. She also restricted any books that could harm the body. So there was a belief among librarians, particularly in tubercular hospitals, that certain books could increase the temperature of patients and cause their pulses to race. So in particular, there was a biography of Houdini that was really popular, and a naval historian and wrote an article about it. And she said, I know everyone wants this book, but it's so dangerous for so many reasons, we have to ban it. Because for tubercular patients, reading about his escapes is so exciting that their pulses will race, their temperatures will go up, and that's so dangerous for them. And for mental patients, first of all, the references to straight jackets in his escapes will be triggering, it's like a modern phrase, but also the not explain how he does it will be so maddening that it will make the mental patients much, much worse. So we have to ban that book. She also banned any books that would inspire interest. So an inward focus was thought dangerous for all patients, and many books of all genres were censored if the librarian believed it would cause patients to focus on their own issues. And this is a broader question in the field a broader question in our lives as readers. 
If something is going wrong in your life or you have an illness, is it gonna make you feel better to read about a similar situation or someone who has the same illness? Or would you rather be from yourself towards something completely different? For these librarians, the idea that you would read something about your own experience was thought very dangerous and something that they would avoid. But it wasn't something that, this wasn't a hard and fast that in Louise's suite because initially she allowed patients at this hospital to read things about having tuberculosis in particular. So patients wanted things like, there's a journal called the Journal of Outdoor Life that printed recent research care and treatments, and it also printed accounts by people living with tuberculosis that patients like to read. They wanted novels that had characters who were living with tuberculosis, and even poetry that described the experience of with that disease. In particular, it was a poet very popular during World War I called Robert Service, and he wrote a poem called Happy Jack, which I'll spare you, except to say that it's a very lurid description of what it's like to have tuberculosis. Spoiler alert, Happy Jack dies in the end in a very gruesome death. And that was the most popular poem in this hospital. So we might wonder why that was. People living with tuberculosis wanting to read in some ways about their own fate allows this in the hospital, but then by the mid-20s, when she's working with veterans by then, she changes her mind and restricts all of that material. Broadly, in all the war hospitals, this issue of introspection became a real issue. Patients frequently requested histories of the war itself. Even while the war was still being fought, people were publishing histories of the war. Now consider, this is the greatest event of their lives. This is the most important event that they've ever taken part in. They want to read they want to think about their role in it. But librarians thought this was so dangerous because it would cause introspection, they banned it. So some soldiers got around this by directly ordering the books themselves to be delivered to them at the hospital. That's how much they wanted to read those books. Those are often a time when there's medical innovations and World War I is no different. And we can think about that in the use of books too, that there are braille books made available to patients during the war. For men with shell shock, some librarians um, try ways, either by giving them copies of National Geographic or scrapbooks that were made by people at home and sent overseas because they believed that reading would literally rob the body of energy and they believed people had their bodies depleted by energy. So to ask them to read would be dangerous. So they were only given materials that were um, picture-based, image-based. Um, at the end of the war, hospital librarians still debated what made for a life -saving but they never doubted that books could save lives and have a curative value. Some physicians in the war hospitals noted the books librarians dispensed in patients' charts as a part of their treatment. Hospital librarians for whom this work mattered saw the beginning of a new field. One librarian wrote, those of us who had experience with the nervous and mental patients in camp hospitals and those of us who continued to work among them long enough to see results realized that a new field of work was before us had never been open before and possibilities for service presented to us that we had not even suspected. The war had been an incubator for ideas and technologies, especially in medicine. And after the war, some of these new therapies and fields became parts of hospitals. So we can think about occupational therapy, dietetics, nutrition as a field, social work, and even psychiatry, which had renewed places in modern hospitals after the war. And bibliotherapists thought that they would be they dreamed that there would be a department of bibliotherapy in every hospital in America, which if anyone here has ever visited a hospital, you may already know there is no department of bibliotherapy in any hospital in America. So in some sense, I, we might want and but first I want to mark Connecticut's role in this history. Um, because they did try to make this a science after the war, a science that could be broadly applied to large patient populations in hospitals, and actually significant role in that history. This is the photo I showed you at the beginning. Um, it's at Bridgeport Hospital, which was one of the first in the country to incorporate therapeutic reading um, programs developed during the war into civilian hospitals. They actually worked with the Bridgeport Public Library to establish a branch of the Bridgeport Public Library in the Bridgeport Hospital. And they had a librarian stationed there. And she was considered an employee of the library, but she worked in the hospital. They made rounds let patients select books, and they also prescribed them. 
There was a real value of a professional librarian at the hospital because of her ability to prescribe and censor. In hospitals before this, mainly chaplains or volunteers just dispense books patients choose freely. But librarians were so essential, as they told everyone, because they knew the difference between poison and medicine. Um, and this librarian is no different. She actually joined with other colleagues to make prescription forms for books. And we can see some of them here. Uh, on the right here, this one is difficult to see, but it says, kindly suggest the type of books and magazines suitable for this patient's reading. And then it gives various genres. And then both the librarian surgeon have to sign this prescription form. And on the left is a description of the uh, labels that the librarian at Bridgeport put in all of her books. And some of them included not advisable for all patients, not patient, and depressing. Um, she believed this was important because patients were so suggestible when they were sick. And she had to keep patients from reading books that would touch on their own issues. And to make that point, she told this following anecdote in a newspaper newspaper. Would you give a copy of Moby Dick with its descriptions of the excruciating pain suffered by the sailor during the fitting of his wooden leg to a man just recovering from a leg amputation? And supposedly wise enough to know not to do that. Therefore, you needed a professional librarian prescribing these books. Bibliotherapy was valued by members of the medical staff at Bridgeport Hospital. It became a model for the nation. Even during the Great had to economize, they kept this program. Um, it was not to last this field in this form, but that's not unique to Bridgeport. The first generation of bibliotherapy after the war imagined a system to treat populations, and they, this struggled because the use of books as medicine depends so much on individual application. For example, no two readers in this room would read the same book in the same way. So with that in mind, it's very difficult the same book even for the same diagnoses and expect to have the same effects. It's unclear when this program ebbs, but I would imagine it's in the 1940s or 50s when the lack of hospital stays decreased nationwide and also television hospitals in those decades as a form of recreation that competed with books. Um, that's not to say that bibliotherapy disappeared. It very much still exists, just not in this form, and I'm very happy to talk about what it looks like today. Although bibliotherapy is not a department in every hospital, the idea that books can serve as medicine lives on. In my online exhibit, which I encourage everyone to visit if they're so interested, I ask people to offer prescriptions for someone going through a challenging time. The responses show the enduring belief in the power of, the, of power of books to heal and the myriad ways they do so, and ways that might be hard to replicate. And here we might think of our opening exercise of the difficulty of for another person. At the beginning of my talk, I showed you a photo of Armory Square Hospital during the Civil War. And Walt Whitman worked as a nurse there, reading the paper to patients, helping them write letter, letters home, and offering comfort. And he said, the real war will never get in the books. I hope what I've been able to communicate today is that for those who served in World War I, the war would not have been as easy to bear without their books and the librarians who served them. Thank you. Any questions? Great question. Uh, not, not really. They sort of worked during the war based on the power they invested in themselves as experts. And many of the people who were therapy during the war had worked previously as institutional librarians doing extension work. So, for example, in the Midwest in particular, they had been librarians who were hired by state boards of control in Iowa, in particular in Minnesota, and create libraries at state institutions, whether orphanages, prisons, insane asylums, tubercular hospitals, et cetera, and then use volunteers to maintain them. And they would travel around and, and create those kind of libraries. So they do try to create a training program which largely does not get off the ground because no one can really agree on what kind of skills like bibliotherapists would most need. But great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
That's a really great question because something that people who are either librarians or librarians, um, big fans of libraries, is we kind of imagine that librarians always come down on the side of free speech. And that was not the case during World War I. So generally within the library, censorship of anything that was pro-German, um, pro-communist, pro-anarchist, pro-anything that was sympathetic to the colonies of our partners. So for example, we're here very close to seeing and I'm not just saying this because my name is Mary Margaret Mahoney, but um, there were a lot of books that were pulled from the collections because they were um, in favor of the Irish Revolution, which had just happened. Uh, but it was complicated because it was not a popular war, um, broadly. A lot of the public really didn't support it, if for no other reason than it was very unclear why we were actually fighting this war, other than a complicated system of diplomatic alliances that triggered our involvement until right before we actually entered the war. So even leading up to the war, the public mood was so against us joining the war effort that people were sending blank checks to, public li to their local public libraries saying, I don't care what you buy, but you have to use this money for German books and put them in your collections because they were trying to stop any kind of publicity campaign by the government to move public mood against Germany. And this was a war that eventually in which that was somewhat successful, for example, came Liberty Cabbage, we may think about 9-11 and calling French fries freedom fries. I mean, these trends continue. But it's a long way of saying, for the librarians in the war, it wasn't complicated for them to censorship in ways it may surprise us now. So there was a kind of political censorship and then a censorship of books that might have ill effects on the mind and body. Censorship politically or censorship for mind and body? For politically, yeah. I, there was broad censorship in public libraries, so far as I can tell. And it, it's kind of surprising because, as I said before, we think about librarians and free speech and this being such an important issue, but during World War I, at least, it wasn't something that really pushed back. There was some pushback um, publicly, but really not that much, and that may actually surprise us. It hasn't been super well studied, so if anyone here is really into library history, I would encourage you to, that would be a really cool topic to pursue. Is anything going on today in uh, libraries which could be of therapy for the And was that website on your website? That's my website. Research? Um, yeah. Okay, but for presentation, you looking for applications today? Sure, yeah, I mean, people are sharing books that they have read in their own lives that they found helpful and explaining why that is. Um, and basically, bibliotherapy still does, it's become more diffuse. So as in medicine, there was a move away from institutions. We might think about the fact that most state mental hospitals have closed in the 60s and 70s. And uh, bibliotherapy kind of bore the brunt of this. It plays a role in various forms of therapy. It's used by therapists, it's used in schools, and it's used in prisons. There was a famous case where there was um, a bibliotherapy program put into a prison to calm the patients down, and reading those books so much that it caused a overthrow in the prison, it caused a revolt in the prison. Um, but bibliotherapy is very much still alive now, and actually you'll see people practicing it who are not um, medical experts or librarians. So in this period, there was a real people if people wanted to prescribe a book, they thought they had to ground that prescription in a form of their own authority, whether it's doctors or librarians. Now people don't really have that kind of worry. There's a place called the School of Life in London, um, and actually one I think lives in Connecticut, uh, and they are a, a novelist and an artist, and they started a bibliotherapy clinic where you can play a, a pay a fat, flat fee, and you go in and talk to them and say, these are my problems, this is what I want help with, prescription via email of like seven books that will help you. And in one case, they had a, a journalist from The Guardian go undercover into this school of life. And he went in and I think he just described his life to them. And they sort of read him and said, it seems like you only talk about men as your favorite authors. So we think you have a problem with women. So here's a prescription of all these books by women. Um, so I think the challenge of bibliotherapy now is that the human experience is so diverse. 
um, everyone here is so different and unique, that to prescribe a book that will meet your exact needs is a real challenge. So who's best equipped to do that, you or me as a pseudo-expert? But that's not to deny that books can't serve as medicine. From reading important is that a therapeutic encounter with a book. The debate really is, can we professionalize that and how? Yes. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. No, no, no. You're right on. You're right on point. The idea that introspection is dangerous to someone's mental health is a very old idea, and actually, we can think about it. Find century. So if anyone here is familiar with the short story, The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, where she imagines women in the wallpaper speaking to her, she's recuperating from neurasthenia, or what we might call hysteria. She's restricted of all way of treating her. And the person who created that treatment was called Dr. S. Ware Mitchell in Philadelphia. And a lot of people think based on her story that he never allowed women to read at all, when in fact he didn't allow them to read things that were introspective. He thought that was the most dangerous thing. Anything that would let them focus on their own issues was something that would make their symptoms worse. Anything that would take them away from it, like a travel book or a history book, was actually medicinal. Um, so introspection was the worst thing in the world. Actually, um, William Dean Howells, who was a close friend of Mark Twain, his daughter was treated by Esther Mitchell and died um, not long at, into the treatment. And it turned out after discovered she had a heart condition, but when he was trying to make sense of her death in a letter to Mark Twain, he said the thing that killed her was that she was not allowed to read. And because she wasn't allowed to read, she had too much time to think about her own issues and turn in killed her. So the idea of introspection being dangerous and books being a gateway to that was something that wasn't necessarily gendered um, all the time. Right, so maybe I misspoke there. There were likely given manuals by the Army, but the libraries thought of themselves as supplementing those training materials by offering all kinds of books and um, war histories and all kinds of other materials. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much.